science is, it is hard work. Uh, you do things over and over again, and sometimes your best ideas don't come out as planned. But it's really punctuated by these snapshots. Uh, if you have gone through life moments, you've been married, you've had a child, a grandchild, whatever you've done, you probably have a crystalline, vivid memory of the day or moment and of that event in your life. And um, as scientists, we're really actually privileged to have those moments happen even when you're not reproducing. So uh, you can look down the microscope and you know, I will never forget the day. So uh, I was a young independent faculty member at the Carnegie and we had taken on the challenge of trying to study stem cells. I think Steve already mentioned this. I have to just get this embarrassing thing out of the way. Uh, although I admit it's equally as embarrassing as diarrhea. Uh, the fact that we study stem cells in the testis. And I cannot tell you how many times the people in my family have found this hilarious to think of me and a lab of mostly other women ripping the testes out of animals all day long. But that is what we do. But luckily, it is not animals really, it's fruit flies. And then that brings on a lot more questions. Why are you killing all these fruit flies? What are you doing? You know. But it's true, we study stem cells and the fruit flies because number one, they don't really mind dying for our cause like other animals and people certainly would. But there are so many fundamental principles that govern the way that cells behave in a tissue that um, we can learn a great deal of basic biology using these little flies to figure out how stem cells really work in an intact tissue, because that is our major goal. You've all heard about stem cells because they're in the New York Times all the time. As we get older or our parts don't work, we're really hoping that somebody clever will come up with a way to use stem cells to fix our problems. And that's been going on beautifully since the 1960s whenever anyone needs bone marrow transplant. Hematopoietic stem cells do the work. However, now that we have stem cells that can be tailored to individuals, um, first we had embryonic stem cells in the 1990s derived from human embryos. And then much more recently from the Yamanaka lab in Japan, we've had induced pluripotent stem cells which can be made from your skin to match you and then can be converted into any kind of cell type you can imagine. Of course, this is a very tantalizing potential therapy. And now any of you have probably spoken to many people that are interested in the use of these things therapeutically for repairing pretty much any body part you can think of. Okay. But we're basic scientists, and instead of using an introduced cell to try to repair some damage, our goal is to actually figure out how they're supposed to be normally working in the first place. So this comes down to a stem cell niche. That's a special local microenvironment that tells the stem cells what to do normally. This is why you keep regrowing your skin, your hair, your blood, your sperm, if you have them. And if you have eggs, I'm sorry, but you're not getting more there are not stem cells for eggs, but sperm is a good, good situation. So in, back in my lab, we had this idea that sounded a little off, but really we believed in the genetics of fruit flies, which uh, are really workhorses for genetics, and the conservation of how cells and molecules work. And we took on a project to try to understand how stem cells work in a fruit fly testis. And it, it actually succeeded. Um, and I will never forget the day. We looked down the microscope at the testes where we were hoping to see some signaling molecule that would tell us how the whole system was actually working. And um, at first, we looked through the scope and we thought there was nothing there at all. It looked blank. But then we looked a little more closely. And so I don't need to describe to you in detail the anatomy of a fruit fly testis. But Suffice it to say, it houses a tiny population of stem cells, and we could see a tiny blue dot in this tissue, and we thought, wow, this is the beginning of a really good story, and it was. And so since then, we and in many other labs now around the world have been able to use this system and other simple systems to figure out what really tells stem cells what to do. Of course, they've got to stick around or you're going to lose your tissue, but they would better not work too well and too vigorously or you're going to get cancer. And so understanding the molecules that control this balance has been our passion. And we've been very fortunate to work amongst a lot of really great colleagues. Because when you use the genetic system to get answers, you get tossed into areas you never even thought you would be studying. And so you need a lot of collaborators around to help you learn. And that's one of the other really exciting things about what we do. And I have to say that I also really appreciate that as scientists, you don't think about this during your training. As a matter of fact, I remember specifically being in graduate school 
and thinking, how can our advisor be complaining about going to Germany? You know, we would love to go to Germany. Send us to Germany. It turns out that if you, if things work out favorably, you get to travel a lot and meet a lot of wonderful people. And uh, that's, that's a real pleasure. Um, so I think um, that over the years, um, we've been able to figure out a lot of basics about how stem cells work that people who really don't care about fruit flies have been very interested in to learn in, uh, to learn the basics from us, and we continue to do that now. Um, and Hopkins really is amazing because I visit these other places on my travels, and I learn the great science. But um, it's really rare to find a place where people are so collegial, and they really are very generous with their time. Um, I've never once felt like an interloper when I've come barreling through the door of a colleague's office, whether there's somebody I've only met once or even not met yet. Um, people are very, very generous with their time, and they're very helpful. And they know that we're all on the same team. And that, that really means a lot, because um, when things are going well for people, they're desirable to other institutions. But I've heard my colleagues tell me many times, you know, I, I really, this is a really great place to be. Um, and even people who aren't from Baltimore uh, can grow to love it because um, it's such a collegial environment. So I've really appreciated that. And, um, and yes, having the money to do it is, is key. And um, I, I, you know, some of the things that Steve said earlier, I wanted to plug my ears and not hear the facts about NIH funding. But um, that was completely essential for me to continue the growth of my lab. And, um, and it's really trying times right now. So, um, but you all know that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to watch the trainees um, face the reality. And, and it is a team sport, so we, we need science to be a healthy venture. It's, uh, you know, it's such an investment to get a person to become a productive scientist. So it's really, it kind of catches your breath when you worry about what's really going to happen next. Because back to stem cells, you know, iPS cells were discovered in Japan. And that country has really anted up to invest in the technology. And uh, it's very exciting. One of the first clinical trials of human iPS-derived cells is going to happen this next year in Japan um, to help people with um, macular degeneration using cells derived from those people. So. If they can do it, I hope we can continue to lead in science. But science is a worldwide endeavor, and when things move quickly, you know, we've, we've got to keep up.